travel that's required to get to these remote locations. Um, like many activists, Peter has had a really diverse involvement in the campaign, from putting people in detention to um, working in refugee resettlement and pulling down the fences up the ground. Peter. Thanks for coming. for the remote clicker, so we've got a manual system set up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't have clicking through manually. So, um, next slide, please. Um, now, tonight's presentation should be over about 40 minutes. It's been aimed at um, sympathisers and potential activists, and not so much towards experienced activists. But it should be of interest to some people who perhaps are uh, not old enough to remember what was happening in the straight political scene in the early 90s, which would be some of the time. And, um, um, yeah, I'll be covering the covering the political land of the issue and, and not so much the question of the human suffering and the terrible stories of, uh, that people have who have been subjected to man detention. Um, and this is a very, very, very large topic, so it's much abbreviated here. And if there's anything that needs further explaining or raises any questions in your mind, feel free to ask questions afterwards. So the outline of the talk, I'll be just talk a bit about Iran. I'll cover some of the history and the um, politics surrounding the introduction of man for detention political dynamics of how it is and how the rhetoric evolved during that period. Um, and then more recently, the situation under the AP government, first under Rowan and later it was Gillard up to the present time. I want to spend some time particularly discussing activism and what its uses and value are and what we've been able to achieve through activism uh, on this issue. Uh, lay out some possible scenarios for how we might imagine mandatory detention to ultimately be ended and how we might actually participate in making that happen. So, uh, RAN began in January 2001, and um, we've got quite a diverse membership and a very informal group. So it's particularly important to, well, it's worthwhile to mention that we don't really have prescriptive policy positions that people are required to subscribe to in order to participate. But um, it would be fair to say that an opposition to mandatory detention is a common denominator. So anyone who's unhappy with mandatory detention and concerned about a lot of the issues that have gone along um, surrounding asylum seekers and refugees and the politics around that in this country would uh, be compatible with RAN. And of course we pursue our campaign to try and ultimately overturn these policies through fellow conventional protests and the convergences that Shannon mentioned, uh, which is sometimes exciting and very interesting. But um, we also do what you might call humanitarian activism which would involve things like visiting our detention centres, but crucially, always with a parallel activist agenda. So that visiting detention is a humane thing to do, but we're also using that as a way to get information about what's happening in the system, to get our different stories, which uh, improves our efforts on our side to make propaganda and persuade people and present arguments to uh, attack the policies. Uh, we do a lot of media liaison as well, so we're also feeding that information we collect in all those different ways, we try and feed that to journalists, cultivate sympathetic journalists and trying to get more of our um, perspective on the issue into the media. Um, RAN does that function as a proper network these days and we've on the campus groups which is a really good development because I can certainly remember times when it was embarrassing to use the name network because the network consisted of just the same six people up around the day and once again complaining how hard it was to get people out of this slide. Um, this is the data for uh, photo from 1976 to 2011. I won't spend much time talking about it now, but I may refer to it a few times during the talk. But down here is the Vietnamese, here's the um, Cambodian arrivals and women's mandatory detention. Here's the Afghanis, the Iraqis and the Iranis, and here again is the Afghanis, Iraqis, um, Afghanis and um, the Tamils. So, it's like. um, so the law of mandatory detention was first introduced by the Keating Labor government in 1992, the minister was Jerry Han. And at the very, it's very interesting to point out and note that at the very first reading in May 1992, Jerry Han said in the parliament, the government is determined to send a strong signal that migration to Australia may not be achieved by simply arriving in this country and expecting to be allowed into the community. Now what's interesting about that, even at this very early stage, and in fact even slightly before this, this, this rhetoric of blaming the refugees is already proven in the subtext here is saying that this is not about refugees, this is not about human rights, it's about people trying to scam the system and get a migration outcome. And that's even at this very early stage. And what's interesting about that is that this is apparently adults with the dominant AOP rhetoric at that time. Now one could be forgiven in the early 90s, 
in the early 90s for thinking that the ARP was the party against racism. Um, we still had a Department of Multicultural Affairs, which was initially, which was the Department Against Racism, as opposed to the Department of Immigration, which was pretty much the Department for Racism. Um, and that was started by the ARP in the 70s. Uh, we, we had you know, federally funded anti-racism campaigns, we had Paul Keating with rhetoric like we have to find our security within Asia, not from Asia, we have to engage with Asia. And yet, despite all this rhetoric at one level, this anti-sort of racist rhetoric, they're slipping into, you know, getting into racist undertones in some of their arguments to justify mandatory detention. Now, if you talk to people, some of the old hands in the ARP who were around at that time, what they'll say to you, what it was all about was sensitivity surrounding the Cambodian peace process. Now, at that time in the early 90s, the Labor Party and Gareth Evans, the Foreign Minister, were fairly heavily invested in trying to broker a peace agreement in, or a peace arrangement in Cambodia in the aftermath of the Vietnam War and um, a whole lot of geopolitics here, which we haven't got time to go into. And, and a part of that involved the repatriation of some 300,000 Cambodian refugees from Thailand back across the border into Cambodia. Now, some of those 300,000 Cambodians didn't like the idea and got on boats to try and come to Australia. And um, probably, can we go back to the rise? And um, yeah, and so that's these, uh, and so that's these Cambodians here in the early 90s, and they were probably trying to do something like the refugees, the Vietnamese refugees, refugees did. And um, of course, the government response at this time was pretty. There was some initial reluctance, but ultimately, the ARP and the coalition took a bipartisan approach and said, well, we're just going to let people in because that's the main thing to do. We'll process them in Southeast Asia, we'll bring them in. Alternatively, and back to the front, uh, ahead again, yep. Uh, but, of course, in the early 90s, the ARP said, well, we can't do that. And the argument, as it goes, is that it would have been inconsistent with their efforts in the peace process. Because on the one hand, they're saying, oh, we're going to make it all peaceful in Cambodia, the 300,000 can come back. But if they're accepting refugees at the same time, that's admitting that it's not safe to go back. And so therefore the obvious solution is to have indefinite mandatory detention without charge or trial, which at the very least is um, slight, no, two points please. At the very least you just have to draconian approach, but it's hard to really avoid the conclusion or the suspicion at least that the pandering to racism was also a factor. Because while in the early in the late 70s, both the coalition and the AP were clearly willing to just either shout down or ignore the racist voices that were hostile, and they were there, that were hostile to the Vietnamese resettlements, it's pretty clear the ARP wasn't willing to take up any arguments like that with respect to the Cambodians. So a bit of a diplomatic issue, but also some reluctance just to take up a political argument. Slide, please. The next period to um, discuss is from 96 to 98, and this is where the racist politics around asylum seekers really start to emerge strongly, and how the coalition's um, uh, elected in 1996 with power of the PM, and a really important thing, which oops, sorry, um, is that Pauline Hanson was elected as the independent member for Oxley in Queensland at that election, and famously gave a very racist maiden speech in the parliament, declaring that you know Australia was in danger of being swamped by Asians and such things. Now, quite quickly, um, quite quickly, the um, a couple of right-wing nut jobs called Pasco and um, Oldfield sort of gravitated around Pauline Hanson and they formed the, the, a party for Pauline Hanson's One Nation. And this was basically a racist party, if you ask me. Um, they, in the next two years, they had a remarkable degree of electoral success and particularly in the 1998 Queensland election, One Nation got about 25% of the vote, which represented about 11 out of 89 seats in the unicameral parliament in Queensland, which was a stunning result. Uh, in, in July, the very next month of that year, Hanson essentially proposed the idea of temporary protection visas, which would say that refugees who come here shouldn't get permanent protection, they should just be allowed to stay until it's safe to go home and then we send them back. Now, at that time, Philip Ruddock was the Liberal Immigration Minister, and he commented, and Philip Ruddock at this time did have a long reputation as a human rights advocate, member of Amnesty International and various things like that, uh, on the West, so-called West, the left wing of the Liberal Party. Excuse me. And at the time, his comment, was that One Nation's approach, he, he described it as being highly objectionable. Now, how could you possibly subject people to this uncertainty? Don't you understand the trauma that they will experience in not having the certainty to be able to rebuild their lives? And, you know, it's just terrible, we can't do this. But in October of that year, in the federal election, One Nation was also moderately successful. Um, not as successful 
in the, in the uh, state election, but still significant. And you can find political analysis around that would say that um, it wasn't an overwhelming, uh, it was not an overwhelming majority of the um, One Nation vote came from the coalition. It was about, for every three votes that went to the One Nation, it was about two from the coalition and one from Labor. So more damaging to Labor than, uh, more damaging to the Liberal Party than uh, the Labor Party, but still significant to the Labor Party. And um, in that election, they really lost a lot of ground. But the majority was cut from 46 to 12, which is quite a lot. And they were also starting to run into trouble with some of their industrial relations. We had, they, took, they took on the union movement. We had the maritime unions dispute. Um, there were, uh, slide please. Uh, in the next year or two, there was also a number of um, large business failures, like Ansett and uh, Longtel which resulted in mass job losses and people not receiving their entitlements. And so the government started to run into trouble. They're losing ground. My nation's presenting a bit of a threat to them. And so they changed tack. And by the very next year, not more than one year, not much more than one year after Radek had said that TKVs were a terrible idea, it's introduced as government policy. And Radek now says, asylum seekers are now seeking to get to the front of the queue. And so they've jumped on this bandwagon of demonising asylum seekers that's been started by the AOP in a, not a very strong way, but definitely in a clear way. And they've taken that ball and they've run with it. Now, it's also interesting to note that One Nation wasn't just a single issue party. They just, didn't have a, they just didn't have a migration policy or a refugee policy. They had taxation policies, and they had trade policies, and they had a broad policy suite. Now, most of the policies were criticised and ridiculed with good reason. But it's interesting to observe that the Liberal government at that time pinched some of these policies. But the only policies they pinched were ones that were underpinned by racism and xenophobia. So they didn't take up their taxation policy. They didn't take up any other policy elements, only the elements that were underpinned by racism and xenophobia. Uh, there were some policies that were underpinned that they didn't take up, but certainly all the ones they did were underpinned by racism and xenophobia. Um, and during this period as well, we really see an escalation of demonising language. And, you know, the refugees and terrorists. Heffernan stood up in the parliament and said there is an undeniable link between boat arrivals and terrorism, which is a complete and utter lie. But nevertheless, the media uh, went along with it and didn't call them out on that. And so we saw the increasing use of demonising language, blaming the victims, casting Australians as the victims. You know, they're coming here to exploit our, our generosity and casting Howard as the rescuer. The mainstream media at this time was also both driving and collaborating in the lies, so it's a bit hard to tell uh, who was driving whom there, but it was sort of a combination of the two. Um, and this got so ridiculous and the hyperbole became so extreme that the government could say any outrageous thing and it would be reported as the truth. And a good example would be the children overboard line. It was no evidence that it ever happened and yet it was reported as the truth. And sending the SAS in to repel the tamper and prevent the MV tamper from landing refugees that it had rescued at sea at Australia's request. And that resulted, of course, in the development of the Pacific Solution and shunting people off to Nauru. And the political dynamic for all this, for this theory, is the ALP just conceding the ground. They did not put in any effort whatsoever to take up any arguments, to bust any myths, to call out the government on any lies. They just conceded, 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 both in how they voted in the Parliament and how they discussed the issue in public and in the media. Um, and the government obviously is using refugees to displace the anger and discontent that is being detected in the electorate, largely around industrial relations issues, but also other things, and uh, to make the government appear strong. And clearly, the court caught it with a um, racist and xenophobic vote. And the clearest thing about this is that, as I said before, the One Nation vote wasn't overwhelmingly people that had come from the coalition. It was about two thirds to one third coalition and ARP. And so by courting that constituency, they not only got back the votes, the Liberal Party not only got back the votes they lost to One Nation, they got some of the Labor vote, the vote that Labor lost to One Nation as well. And so that was um, very politically astute of them to do that, if not morally repugnant. <laughs> uh, although it was morally repugnant. So the next period to think about is 2003 to 2007. Now, the, in late, early 2002, the votes pretty much stop and boat arrivals drop away to just about zero. And contrary to the popular, to, you know, the popular political narrative these days, this was mainly due to the Navy's towbacks, where they were just towbacks boats back to Indonesia. A policy that did result in deaths, by the way, which is something that's uh, ignored in the current debate. Um, but it's also... 
I'm, I'm not arguing, I'm just really interested. Was that, it did re the result in death? Yes, there were several drownings, boats foundered on their way back to Indonesia. Yeah. And um, the, well, was uh, but the main issue was the fact that the Taliban, had, after the 9 11 attacks and the invasion of Afghanistan, um, there was an increase in hope amongst people fleeing Afghanistan, things were going to improve, and so one of the big push factors at that time sort of went away. Um, now, because of the fact that the boat arrivals had pretty much stopped, very down to tiny, tiny numbers, um, the government was having a lot of difficulty in maintaining any border protection panic because no boats were arriving and you can't really be making any fuss about it. Uh, we saw Vanstone become the Immigration Minister in 2003, and in response to increasing disquiet about the, ha the harshness of the policy, she starts to introduce some very small adjustments in the way the policy is administered to reduce the amount of harm, but only very slight adjustments and certainly no change in the law. Um, in March 2005, refugee campaigns have been building and building all this time, and we had a very big, a very successful protest at Baxter Detention Centre, um, which is just at the head of Spencer Gulf in, near Port Augusta in South Australia. We had three or four hundred people there. And uh, we had a very, very good media uh, in that. We were very successful in casting the policy as inhumane and draconian. And um, this built more pressure on the government. And we see that by June of that year, so only a few months later, um, the people of the long-term view see this. These are people who've been in immigration detention for three, four, five, seven years, in the case of one person I still know. And for the last five, six, seven years, they've been illegals, they've been terrorists, they've been queue jumpers, they've been you know, disease carriers. All of a sudden, these people are all allowed to reapply for a refugee visa, just arbitrarily, and almost 100% success rate. And so this, more than almost anything else, shows that the policy has got nothing to do with anything except the political needs of the government. When the government perceived it was in their political interests to maintain a really punitive, cruel system which was imposing terrible suffering, to the point of one case that we exposed in 2003, a child going blind in detention because of medical neglect. When they thought it was in their interest to do that, and they were quite happy to. But as soon as there was some analysis that says, oh no, we're better off letting people out, they would let them out. Slight please. The next period was under the AOP, the AOP selected in 2007, Kevin Rudd's the Prime Minister. And um, initially there's still no votes, but by 2008, or by 2009, the votes have started coming again. And um, the AOP, again, not willing to take up any debate or argument, just concede all the ground. But they're not quite comfortable with directly attacking the asylum seekers themselves. So they change tack a little bit and they say, oh, we'll attack. We have to stop the evil people smugglers now. And they deserve the right help. But of course, a consequence of stopping the evil people smugglers is you stop the boats, which is what they really want to do, because that's the hostility to boat arrivals is the thing they're really trying to appease. Um, Gillard dumps her up. Um, nicer, I should say, and she immediately concedes to the boat paranoia. And almost, I think, it might have been the second day of her prime minister's it might have been the first day. Um, essentially, said, I do understand the anxiety and indeed the fears that Australians have when they see boats intercepted. So clearly, I am unwilling to take up any argument to say that people shouldn't be afraid of boat arrivals. In fact, I give them permission to be afraid of boat arrivals. Um, and this, this. Um, pattern of the AP just completely folding and, and, and giving in to any argument or about boat arrivals, any criticism, any attack, continues um, to the point where the coalition is essentially running the policy from opposition. And a good example of that would be 2010, um, there was another spike and um, numbers were increasing, a spike in arrivals, and uh, Morrison, who's the uh, opposition spokesperson for immigration, comments, Christmas Island is a visa factory. That is, you're giving out too many visas. Now, does the AOP take up that argument to say, what, are you telling us we shouldn't give refugee visas to people who are refugees? No, they don't take up that argument. What do they do? They stop processing applications. They stop giving out visas. So even the easiest argument to take up, they just absolutely will not do it. And this results in massive overcrowding and riots. Um, and of course, the government was warned months and months and months beforehand that's what was going to happen. You can't have, you know, I think it was, 1,200 people at one point or something in a facility designed for 600, you're going to have a riot. But the government, the AOP, was willing to have riots, see all that suffering, take all that political damage. They'd rather have that than just take up the argument with the, with, with the Liberal Party. Well, of course, with the refugees, we have to give them visas. What are you talking about? Yeah. So again, a, a terrible, terrible um, unwillingness to take up any arguments. And um, 
And this gets even worse. This dynamic continues <laughs> to the point where the ARP now has essentially got the same policy as the coalition. It's all about stopping the vote to offshore processing. The only debate left is whether it should be in Nauru or Malaysia, which is a meaningless debate. And the assumption we don't want the votes is exactly the same rhetoric, it's exactly the same assumption, piecing exactly the same sentiment from both the coalition and the ARP. Uh, slightly busy. So enough on the dynamics, and the, that's a lot of gaps in there, which someone might want to ask questions about, but we have to rush through this. Um, so why do we do activism? What's the point of it? Well, a critical advantage of working as activists in the way we do it, because we're choosing to work outside the system, it means we're unconstrained by pressure to maintain relationships or privilege. So if Julia Gillard's upset with us because we are criticising her, she can't threaten to be, you know, not invite us to tea in the afternoon or something. Uh, we can't threaten to take away our funding because we don't go to tea with Julia Gillard and we don't get any funding from anyone. We raise the money ourselves. So we're unconstrained. We're free to use whatever political or practical physical tactics that we feel are appropriate and, um, you know, within our moral limits, obviously. Um, next thing to say is that um, this leads us to the situation where it's only the activists, the groups like RAN and similar groups around the country, that are really um, directly taking up the, uh, the, the arguments and directly challenging um, the racism and the legitimacy of mandatory detention itself. And so, the Greens. What's that? And the Greens. Um, that's true. And the Greens, they do that as well. Um, but <coughs> leaving out the mainstream political parties, that's, that's true. So you see the NGOs who all don't like the policy, all the welfare organisations, all the charitable organisations, they won't take up those arguments directly. Uh, the policy alternatives that they put forward are usually got some limited form of mandatory detention, but they won't talk about racism and they won't challenge mandatory detention per se. And so it's left up to the activists and the groups to do that. And um, another reason for activism is the only, it really is the only avenue for most ordinary people to participate in any process contributing to the public debate because there's essentially no electoral remedy. In our system of government, um, the way people are supposed to be able to participate in, in shaping public policy is through the election. You vote for the party that has a policy you like. And in this way, you influence, influence the parties, and this is how you participate in directing public policy. However, on this issue, there's no option there, because both potential governments have exactly the same policy. You have the Greens who have a very good policy, but voting Green is not going to lead to a different government that's going to have a different policy. So there's really no electoral remedy, which leaves only most of us with activism, because most of us aren't billionaires who can just buy up Fairfax and publish whatever opinions we like, and we don't have our own you know, talk about radio shows where we can say what we like. Most of us are just left with getting out on the street and doing activism. And that's a very important thing to do to get out on the street and do activism, because there'd be millions of people in this country who are very hostile to the current policies and laws, but feel quite isolated. Because the main voice they hear are the conservative voices that are anti-refugee. And so they hear the radio, they see the news, they hear the, you know, the politicians from the major, major parties. And that's all from pretty much one perspective. And so it's very easy for people to feel isolated and, not, and lack confidence to even take up their own arguments in their own spaces, around the kitchen table or in the lunchroom at work. But if they see us out on the streets protesting and they see the amount of voice, then they feel more involved. And that's a very important point. Um, it also means that, again, because we're not constrained, uh, we're very flexible and adaptable. So even um, people like the Greens and NGOs with their sort of internal structures, it does limit their adaptability and their flexibility. Uh, the activist groups are very adaptable and flexible and can rapidly address changes, political or physical or any sort of change. And, um, and an important point about that is it means that we're free to work in ways which complement them and um, <coughs> collaborate with other types of groups working in other ways. So some people are working within the legal system, some people are working within the welfare system. The activists are flexible and can find the little gaps in there and fill them in. And Brand's certainly done that in the past with some success. And this allows us to really be a crucial part of the, um, of the equation in developing a broad campaign that covers all the bases and there's no particular issues or problems that aren't being addressed it's like this. So I thought I'd just go through a few activism successes. Just flick down three more points, please. And the last one, please. And um, a good one would be Liam Moore in 2010. One thing about the, um, uh, the, the polling shows and the research, the political research shows, is that 
Children in detention is universally unpopular right across the political spectrum, Labor voter, Liberal voter, whoever. Nobody likes children in detention and they are very sensitive to this. And so what was their approach to dealing with this unpopular element of the detention policy? It's really the only element of the policy that's universally unpopular. Um, they didn't let children out, they just said they went in detention, they just lied. <laughs> and they did this by, re by keeping children in facilities which weren't designated as detention centres. And so despite the fact that there's guards and fences and they can't you know, go out on their own, they can't go to their friends' places after school, they're not in a detention centre, they're in an alternative place of detention, I kid you not, an APOD, and therefore they're not in detention, which is absurd. But it worked. <laughs> they got away with it. The media was, they were always saying, no kids in detention, the media went along with it, didn't have the gumption to look into that any further. So, ran, we got on a bus with a whole pile of toys and we drove the 800 kilometres to Leonora and we stood at the gate and we protested and we, you know, bullied our way in basically and we ended up getting some good media, we got a bit lucky as well, but we did some good media liaison and it came out, there are children in detention and within two months the government had to stop running that line because the lie wasn't working anymore. And uh, it also was a catalyst, it really got a ball rolling. And you saw people like Chill Out reformed, and, the, and they worked specifically on this issue. They got active and started campaigning. Um, some of the child psychologists, uh, psychiatrists like um, Professor Louise Newman got involved and started really getting some traction on the issue. And then we did start to see the government letting kids out. And there have been some, I'll say significant, but not dramatic improvements. And there's still a lot of children in detention. Um, there's still a lot of problems in there, but there's certainly less harm occurring to children because of the system. And that was pretty much coming out of activism. We started that all the time, and then lots of people piled on board, and we've had some good outcomes there. Still lots to do, however. Um, uh, I might just, just quickly go through some like the Indonesian miners in our prisons. That was actually, Rand started that one. We were the first ones. We one some of our people visiting in Perth Detention Centre noticed an Indonesian boy, a 14 year old. They we be quiet about it next time he was in prison. So we started looking into that, and it turns out there was dozens of these children in adult prisons, some getting raped, that was happening. And um, we just kept working on it, working on it, and it built up, and now it's an international issue. Other people got on board, and momentum built, and uh, now it's discussed at the highest levels of government. So that was another one we, um, we prevented deportations. The Cornelia Rouse scandal was exposed by activists. I remember getting calls in 2000. Uh, Six, I think it was, um, from Baxter guys, and Baxter calling us, saying, "Hey, there's this mentally ill woman. She should be in hospital. She shouldn't be here with us. We think she's getting raped by the guards." We never uncovered any evidence that she'd been raped in detention, but we did uncover evidence that she'd been getting perved on while in the shower in the isolation rooms, which have no privacy. Mm -hmm. So the guys weren't very far off when they were concerned about. Yeah. Can you just explain to me where our actually is? So I think that some people. Wouldn't... That's a good point. Um, Cornelia Rao was a mentally ill woman who went missing and ended up um, falling into a delusion that she was German. She had German heritage, but she was a, a permanent resident of Australia and got picked up and ended up in immigration detention. Spent eight months in Baxter, much of it in isolation cells. And despite everyone, like all the other detainees there, everyone was saying this woman's got to be in hospital, she needs treatment. She was just kept in immigration detention, which made her illness worse. And nobody gave a shit, basically. And the government didn't care. The German embassy said she's not our citizen, nothing to do with us. And the activists eventually resorted to publishing the name she was going under, which I forget what it was, but she was using a false name. Again, she was in a delusional state. But it ended up running that name in a newspaper article, which is normally something that we never do, use a name in an article. And one of the family members, one of the friends of the family, in fact, read this article and went, gee, that sounds like it could be Cornelia. And they brought the article to the attention of the family, and sure enough, it turned out it was their missing daughter who's been missing for a year and eight months of it locked up in detention in Baxter getting more and more ill. <laughs> so absolutely astounding. And that was busted open by the activists because maintaining contact with detention, finding out things that are going wrong, blowing the whistle. And um, something we should never ever underestimate is the positive mental health benefits of the detention of our activism. Our visiting, our fighting back against the system in little ways, our protests, it's one of the only things that these people have in detention that it gives them some hope and it even actually helps with their resettlement because when they eventually get visas they come out into a society where they don't feel the whole society is hostile to them because they know there are people who do support them and who have helped them while they were in detention and it really is an important thing that helps people survive the detention experience 
and also survive the resettlement experience. It's like this. So this is how long have we been going for? Twenty-five seconds. Um, this was one of the actions at Baxter in 2005. Um, Perth, Perth, the Perth crew that went to Baxter in 2005 it was the largest group from anywhere around the country. We had about 80 people. And so 80 out of about 300 was a pretty good showing. And there was a bunch of, there was a little group of um, these radical Christian guys who came along, about know, six or eight of them or something. And they decided to do a protest prayer vigil outside the detention centre. And I love this photo, as you can see the riot squad lined up behind, well, just keeping an eye on these damn radical Christians, you know, and I would get up there to burn the place down the And it's such a perfect, it's, I mean, it's such a perfect analogy for the system itself, an extreme authoritarian overreaction to a completely harmless non-problem, which is exactly what the detention system itself is. It's like this. This was Woomera in 2002, where we did something a little bit more serious than praying and pulled out some faces, which was enormous fun. Um, slide please. This was our trip to Curtin in 2011 where we actually fired this bus ourselves and drove it ourselves. Three of us got our licenses and drove it all the way there and back to keep the cost down. And um, that was quite a successful trip. Slide please. And this is back to again in 2005 where these dangerous criminals and meatheads, as we were called, um, with all their balloons, <laughs> trespassing on the sheep paddock where we weren't allowed to leave and provoked quite a strong response from the police, which again resulted in very good media. This juxtaposition of this. <laughs> completely harmless looking protest being confronted with extreme force from the state and it's a very good analogy for the detention system itself and the response to the silence of this slide please. And our dictionaries for refugees projects, one of our soccer activisms where we're sending bilingual dictionaries to people so they can learn English. And um, but it's also a very it's a very humanitarian thing to do, but it's also very good at building up the connections and the trust and the, and the contacts in the amongst the detention population. Um, slide please. So, how would we end mandatory detention? Well, there's a variety of ideas, and they're not all mutually exclusive. So, some of these can be pursued in parallel, some not. I won't really go through them in very in great detail, but ultimately, the policies will change when the political class finds it untenable to maintain them. And we've seen that throughout the recent history of this policy. As soon as it's in their political interests to change it, they will. Or as soon as it's untenable to maintain it, they will. The welfare of the individuals within the system, the consequences, cost of the taxpayer, none of these things are important compared to the political needs of those people who are running the policy um, or in the government. Um, slide please. So how do, we how do we make the transformation from being a sympathiser to an activist? Well we have to understand the political landscape, uh, which I may have covered that briefly in this presentation. We have to understand how activism intervenes in, in, in the whole process. And again, I have a on some way of persuading you that activism can intervene in a very positive and real way. Um, but probably most importantly and perhaps most difficultly, we experience a changing worldview. Because uh, it's hard, the world is not the way it is by accident. People with an agenda and chose to make and the power to do it, chose to make it the way it is. We didn't get mandatory detention through some um, unnoticed evolutionary process that nobody was paying attention to and suddenly had mandatory detention and we all go, well how did this happen? I don't know. You know people did it, it arrived in one fell swoop, the entire policy almost complete, a little bit added to by Howard, but essentially the core of the policy came in one go, boom, mandatory detention. A radical, radical departure from 800 years of legal tradition where we say, okay, we're going to detain people, the courts have got no say, we don't have to have a charge, we can keep them locked up forever. That's contrary to 800 years of legal tradition, a radical change. And people did it because they had an agenda. And the world is maintained the way it is because of an agenda. So today, we might still have the policy not for quite the same reasons or slightly different reasons from why it came in, but there's still an agenda behind it. And the interests of the welfare of all of us, not just the people, the refugees, are actually secondary to these agendas. And this is the scary bit when we start, when we start thinking about becoming an activist. Because we understand that, well, if they can do it to refugees, they can marginalise that group, they can call them terrorists, therefore we can lock them up indefinitely without charge or trial. The kids can go blind, people can commit suicide, but you know, that's alright. They can do that to them. Well, they can actually do that to me. <laughs> the only difference is that they don't have any political need to do it to me, but if it was in their interest to do that to me, they could, and actually they probably would. So that's the scary bit, it makes you feel unsafe. But then you get to the part, the good bit. <laughs> when you start to realise that we are not powerless or defenceless when we act together. We can affect change. 
And we can be the ones that actually change the world because we can have an agenda and we can use our collective power in act with activism, cooperating with other ways of working, but we can affect change. It's like this. So what can you do? Well, you can get informed, you can get active. Um, I've sort of shown you some ways to do that tonight. RAM meetings, the so-called core central RAM, as we're referred to by the campus groups, is, um, which I don't really like that phrase, but I'm happy to remember one, the nucleus RAM group, perhaps. Um, meets at 6.30 p.m. at the Active Centre on Mondays, um, at the moment, uh, slide please. But the next big action you can participate in, hopefully, is our protest at the Yonge Hill Detention Centre, which is up in Northern, recently opened. Um, I, it's, we've got tickets for sale at the store at the back. It will cost between $10 and $20, depending on your circumstances. And I would really encourage people to come to that because, I tell you what, this is one of these maximum security facilities. And for someone who hasn't yet really made a transition in your thinking about activism and understanding how it works, this will make you think. Because you'll go there and you'll look at this edifice, this massive, multi-million, hundreds of millions of dollars built double fences, electric fences, microwave sensors, gates everywhere, it's absurd. And who's locked up in there? People who have not been convicted of any charge, or well, charged of anything, never mind convicted, not, never mind, not even suspected of a crime. And that's a complete disconnect for ordinary people. You think, why does the government have to spend hundreds of billions of dollars? And in fact, the policy is costing in excess of a billion dollars a year over the whole system. What's well, a billion dollars a year for someone who hasn't committed crimes? What's going on? Well, when you start to really understand the political dynamics and the real reasons that underpin it, it does make sense. So the, the perimeter fence is three kilometres um, wide. No, what, it might be about three kilometres circumference, I would say. Oh, okay. um, it wouldn't be three kilometres wide. It's, it's a square centre, it wouldn't be a kilometre on the side, but it'd be getting close. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's a double fence with sterile zone, microwave detectors, cameras everywhere. It's just amazing. And um, much like Baxter's. Slide please. So I'll try to sum up now. I'll just finish that now. I'd like to thank the Wesley Church um, for the use of this hall tonight. We have to beg for things for free. <laughs> um, Phil and Virginia for doing some of the research, Rand for organising, and thank you, the audience, for your attention.